Human history is one of ravenous expansions. We conquered our native ecosystems, made our way out of Africa, and spread all over the world. Throughout this expansion, we decimated other species, with many of them famously going extinct. The dodo lived in peace for almost 10 million years, and we wiped them out within a century of discovering them. Billions of passenger pigeons covered North American skies in the 1800s. And on September 1st, 1914, Martha, the last passenger pigeon, died alone in a zoo. The thylacine ruled Tasmania for 2 million years. And here, in this video, from 1933, you can see the last two live individuals known to us. But we are capable of good too. In recent decades, the rise of conservation and rewilding movements has prevented many species from going extinct. And that is what we want to focus on today. The stories and lessons from three species that almost went down the way of the dodo, but were ultimately saved from extinction by a concerted conservation effort. We hope to turn this into a series on the Mossier's channel to cover stories of endangered animals from different continents. And today we would like to start by featuring three species from North America. So please let us know in the comments if you think the series is a good idea. Now let's begin by looking at an iconic North American giant. The bison. This species of bovine once roamed the prairies of North America in vast herds. They are subdivided in two main subspecies, the wood bison and the plains bison. Historically, they were a source of food to a multitude of species, such as wolves, cougars, and bears. Native American tribes also relied on them heavily for sustenance, and they were also the first humans to hunt them on a regular basis. Their historic range went from Alaska to the Gulf of Mexico and all the way to the Atlantic seaboard. Estimates for their historic population numbers are not very accurate, but a rough figure puts them somewhere between 30 and 60 million individuals in the 1700s. The downfall of this species began with the European settlement of the West, but the hunting only really started picking up speed in the 1830s with the construction of the railroad, which brought a lot more settlers west. By the 1870s, extensive commercial operations were created, which turned sustainable hunting into wholesale slaughter. This meant that by 1884, the population reached its lowest point, with only 324 bison left. Following the last great hunts, people gathered the remnants of the herds, some as small as four or five individuals, and then started to breed them. Such was the case of the famous herd of James Scotty Phillip in South Dakota. He bought 74 bison that had been bred from five individuals roped as calves in the last great hunt of the Grand River in 1981. He then bred that herd, and by the time of his death in 1911, the herd had grown to more than a thousand individuals. There was a clear economic incentive to preserve the bison, but the individuals involved in these actions described their main motivation as one of wanting to preserve the species, because they felt guilty and sad at the decimation of such an iconic animal. I'm not sure how much of a conservation lesson you can derive from that, but I would say that guilt and sadness are some of the strongest drivers that can motivate people to save a species, and that has to count for something. Now let's turn to the skies and look at the extreme case of the mighty California condor. This impressive animal belongs to the vulture family and is the largest land bird in North America. Their wingspan can reach 3.4 meters and they can live to the ripe old age of 60. Their habitat is predominantly the rocky shrublands, coniferous forests and oak savannas common in the western United States. Like most other vultures, they feed on carcasses and thus provide an important service that helps keep the ecosystem healthy. In the 1700s, the condor ranged along the Pacific coast, from British Columbia all the way to Baja California. Their population numbers are unknown, but they were abundant and estimated to number in the tens of thousands. Vultures in general are not the most beloved animals, unfortunately, and historically, they were shot if possible. However, what really brought down the condor population was what they ate. The carcasses shot and left by hunters often caused the condors to be poisoned with the lead in the ammunition. Early settlers also used large amounts of strychnine to kill predators like wolves and grizzlies, and then the scavengers feeding on those carcasses were also poisoned. And then DDT, a common insecticide, delivered the final blow. The contamination of the food chain with DDT led to the thinning of the eggs of many birds, which would break before hatching. For a bird that only becomes mature at the age of 6 and only lays an egg every other year, this is a major issue. This had such an effect that by 1967 there were only 60 individuals left in the wild, and they were designated as an endangered species. Then, in 1975, the first recovery plan was set up, aiming to start a breeding program further down the line. 
This did not prove effective enough, and the numbers continued to decline, which led to the decision of capturing all wild individuals and adding them to the breeding programs. This was completed in 1987, when Condor AC9 was brought in, thus making it extinct in the wild. The breeding programs were led by the San Diego Wild Animal Park and the Los Angeles Zoo, and they proved quite successful. By 1992, there were 86 condors, and seven of them were released back into the wild. Some of them died, but with further releases and further breeding, the wild and captive populations started growing again. And as of 2019, there are more than 500 condors in the world. Their situation is still quite precarious, but not as desperate as it once was. The recovery of the condor was quite different from the recovery of the bison. It cost more than $35 million and was only successful due to the excellent work done by breeding centers at the zoos. People like myself who love wilderness often don't love zoos as they put animals in confined spaces. However, the condor is a clear example of where zoos played a crucial role in saving a species and also where they fit in the conservation ecosystem. For our third and final protagonist, let's turn to the ocean and look at the curious case of the sea otter. This fluffy critter is a keystone species that keeps kelp ecosystems in balance by eating sea urchins. It is native to the northern coastlines of the Pacific Ocean, living along the coast and in the estuaries. Its historic range was from Baja California all the way across the Aleutian Islands to Japan, and its population numbered somewhere between 150 and 300,000 individuals. The Russians were the first ones to get started hunting the populations from the Aleutian Islands, and they went all the way to Alaska, and they were soon followed by the Americans. By 1808, the populations were so depleted that hunting stopped being viable, and conservation measures were imposed. This gave wild populations some respite, so that by the time Alaska was sold to the United States in 1867, the population there had recovered to more than 100,000 individuals. However, Americans resumed hunting, and by the early 1900s, the global sea otter population was down to about 1,000 individuals. Finally, in 1911, and on the brink of extinction, the United States, Russia, Japan, and Great Britain signed the North Pacific Fur Seal Convention to try and control the fur trade in the Pacific and preserve species that were harvested. Throughout the 20th century, this protection helped their numbers rebound from the remnants of wild populations, so that by the year 2000, there were around 128,000 sea otters worldwide. This strong rebound in population numbers has been attributed to a mix of factors, including habitat conservation and reintroductions. However, the primary driver seems to have been simply the protection they received that allowed them the space and the opportunity to thrive. Sometimes one of the best conservation tools can be to simply give nature the opportunity to regenerate, to rewild, and to take back the space. This approach is core to the rewilding movement, which we are happy to be a part of. And if you want to learn more about why sea otters are such an important keystone species and how they help stop sea urchins from destroying kelp forests, you should watch this video right here. Until next time. Cheers!